Okay, this first piece is from when Rachel Corey was 10 years old. Just to give you an idea of the kind of soul and the kind of person we're talking about here. She was 10 years old. I'm here for other children. I'm here because I care. I'm here because children everywhere are suffering and because 40,000 people die each day from hunger. I'm here because those people are mostly children. We have got to understand that the poor are all around us and we are ignoring them. We've got to understand that these deaths are preventable. We've got to understand that people in third world countries think and care and smile and cry just like us. We have got to understand that they dream our dreams and we dream theirs. We have got to understand that they are us and we are them. My dream is to stop hunger by the year 2000. My dream is to give the poor a chance. My dream is to save the 40,000 people who die each day. My dream can and will come true if we all look into the future and see the light that shines there. If we ignore hunger, that light will go out. If we all help and work together, it will grow and burn free with the potential of tomorrow. Ten years old. There's just some very touching words, I thought. Leaving Olympia. Rachel was from Olympia, Washington. We are all born, and someday we'll all die, most likely to some degree alone. What if our aloneness isn't a tragedy? What if our aloneness is what allows us to speak the truth without being afraid? What if our aloneness is what allows us to adventure, to experience the world as a dynamic presence, as a changeable and interactive thing? If I lived in Bosnia or Rwanda or who knows where else, needless death wouldn't be a distant symbol to me. It wouldn't be a metaphor, it would be a reality. And I have no right to this metaphor, but I use it to console myself. To give a fraction of meaning to something enormous and needless. This realization, this realization that I will live my life in this world where I have privileges. I can't cool boiling waters in Russia, and I can't be Picasso, I can't be Jesus, and I can't save the planet single-handedly, but I can wash dishes. February 7th, 2003. Hi, friends and family and others. I've been in Palestine for two weeks and one hour now, and I have very few words to describe what I see. It is most difficult for me to think about what's going on here when I sit down to write back to the United States something about the virtual portal in luxury. I don't know if many of the children here have ever existed without tank shell holes in their walls and the towers of an occupying army surveying them constantly from their near horizons. I think, although I'm not entirely sure, that even the smallest of these children understand that life is not like this everywhere. An eight-year-old was shot and killed by an Israeli tank two days before I got here. And many of the children murmur his name to me, Ali or point out the posters of him on the walls. The children also love to get me to practice my limited Arabic by asking me, Kafi Sharon? Kafi Bush? And they laugh when I say, Bush Majnoon, Sharon Majnoon, back in my limited Arabic. How is Sharon? How is Bush? Bush is crazy and Sharon is crazy too. Of course, this isn't quite what I believe and some of the adults who have the English to correct me. Bush is a businessman. Today I tried to learn to say Bush is a tool but I didn't think it translated quite right. But anyway, there are eight-year-olds here, much more aware of the workings of the global power structure than I was just a few years ago. Nevertheless, no amount of reading, attendance at conferences, documentary viewing, and word of mouth could have prepared me for the reality of the situation here. You just can't imagine it unless you see it. And even then, you are always well aware that your experience of it all is not the reality. What with the difficulties the Israeli army would face if they shot an unarmed U.S. citizen, and with the fact that I have money to buy water when the army destroys wells, and the fact, of course, that I have the option of leaving. Nobody in my family has been shot driving in their car by a rocket launcher from a tower at the end of a major street in my hometown. I have a home. I am allowed to go see the ocean. Ostensibly, it is still quite difficult for me to be held for months or years on end without a trial. This because, I'm a, because I am a white U.S. citizen as opposed to many others. When I leave for school or work, I can be relatively certain that there will not be heavily armed soldiers waiting for me halfway between Mud, Tay, Mud Bay and downtown Olympia. 
So, if I feel outrage at arriving and entering briefly and incompletely into the world in which these children exist, I wonder conversely about how it would be for them to arrive in my world. They know that children in the United States don't usually have their parents shot, and they know they, that they sometimes get to see the ocean. But once you have seen the ocean and lived in a silent place where water is taken for granted and not stolen in the night by bulldozers, and once you have spent an evening when you haven't wondered if the, if the walls, of your ha uh, walls of your home might suddenly fall inward waking you from your sleep, and once you've met people who have never lost anyone, once you've experienced the reality of a world that isn't surrounded by murderous towers, tanks, armed settlements, and now a giant metal wall, I wonder if you can forgive the world for all the years of your childhood spent existing. Just existing. In resistance to the constant stranglehold of the world's fourth largest military, backed by the world's only superpower, in its attempt to erase you from your home. That is something I wonder about these children. I wonder what would happen if they really knew. As an afterthought to all this rambling, I am in Rafa, a city of about 140,000 people, approximately 60% of whom are refugees, many of whom are twice or three times refugees. Rafa existed prior to 1948, but most of the people here are themselves or are new descendants of people who were re relocated here from their homes in historic Palestine, now Israel. Rafah was split in half when the Sinai returned to Egypt. Currently, the Israeli army is building a 14-meter high wall between Rafah and Palestine and the border, carving a no-man's land from the houses along the border. 602 homes have been completely bulldozed, according to the Rafah. The number of homes that have been partially destroyed is greater. Rafah existed prior to 1948, but most of these people here themselves are descendants of people who were relocated here. In addition to the constant presence of tanks along the border and in the western region between Rafah and settlements along the coast, there are more IDF towers here than I can, than I can count. Others, others these strange spiral staircases draped in some kind of netting to make the activity within anonymous, some hidden, just beneath the horizon of buildings. A new one went up the other day in the time that it took us to do laundry and to cross town twice to hang banners. Despite the fact that some of, these area, the, some of these areas nearest to the border are the original Rafa with families who have lived on this land for at least a century, only the 1948 camps in the center of the city are Palestine-controlled areas. I've been having trouble accessing news about the outside world here, but I hear an, es an escalation of war on Iraq is inevitable. There is a great deal of concern here about the reoccupation of Gaza. Gaza is reoccupied every day to various extents, but I think the fear is that the tanks will enter on the streets and remain here instead of entering some of the other streets and then withdrawing after some hours or days to observe and shoot from the edges of their communities. If people aren't already thinking about the consequences of this war for the people of the entire region, then I hope that you will start. I also hope that you'll come here for the people of the entire region. We've been wavering between five and six internationals. The neighborhoods that have asked us have asked us for some form of presence are Yabina, Tel Sultan, Hai Salam, Brazil, and Block J Zoom. There is also need for constant nighttime presence at a well on the outskirts of Rafa since the Israeli army destroyed the two largest wells. According to the municipal water offices, the wells destroyed last week provided half of Rafa's water supply. Many of the communities have requested internationals to be present at night to attempt to shield houses from further demolition. After about 10 p.m., it is very difficult to move because the Israeli army treats anyone in the streets as resistance and shoots at them. So clearly, we are too few. I continue to believe that my home in Olympia could gain a lot and offer a lot by deciding to make a commitment to Rafa in the form of a sister community relationship. Some teachers and children's groups have expressed interest in email, exchange, in email exchanges, but this is the, only the tip of the iceberg of solidarity work that might be done. Many people want their voices to be heard, and I think we need to use some of our privilege as internationals to get those voices heard directly in the U.S., rather than filter through of the well-meaning internationals such as myself. I am just beginning to learn from what I expect to be a very intense tutelage about the ability of people to organize against all odds and to resist against all odds. My love to everyone, my love to mom, my love to smooch, my love to FG and barn hair and seamless and Lincoln School, my love to Olympia. Rachel. February 20th, 2003. Mama, 
Now the Israeli army has dug up the road to Gaza and both of the major checkpoints are closed. This means that Palestinians who want to go and register for their next quarter at university can't. People can't get to their jobs and those who are trapped on the other side can't get home. And internationals who have a meeting tomorrow in the West Bank won't make it. We could probably make it through if we made serious use of our international white person privilege, but that would also mean some risk of arrest and deportation, even though none of us has done anything illegal. The Gaza Strip is divided in thirds now. There is some talk about the reoccupation of Gaza, but I seriously doubt this will happen, because I think it would be geopolitically stupid move for Israel right now. I think the more likely thing is an increase in smaller below the international outcry radar incursions and possibly the off-tinted population transfer. I'm staying put in Rafah for now. No plans to head north. I still feel like I'm relatively safe and think that my most likely risk in, my most likely risk in case of a larger scale incursion is arrest. A move to reoccupy Gaza would generate a much larger outcry than Sharon's assassination. Know that I have a lot of very nice Palestinians looking after me. I have a small flu bug and got some very nice lemony drinks to cure me. Also, the woman who keeps the key for the well where we sleep still keeps asking me about you. She doesn't speak a bit of English, but she asks about my mom pretty frequently, wants to make sure that I'm calling home. Love to you and Dad and Sarah and Chris and everybody. Rachel. February 27, 2003. To her mother. Love you, Mom. Really miss you. I have bad nightmares about tanks and bulldo bulldozers outside our house and you and me inside. Sometimes the adrenaline acts as an anesthetic for weeks and then in the evening or at night it just hits me again. A little bit of the reality of the situation. I am really scared for the people here. Yesterday I watched a father lead his two tiny children holding his hands out into the sight of tanks and a sniper tower and bulldozers and jeeps because he thought his house was going to be exploded. Jenny and I stayed in the house with several women and two small babies. It was our mistake in translation that caused him to think it was his house that was being exploded. In fact, the Israeli army was in the process of detonating an explosive in the ground nearby, one that appears to have been planted by the Palestinian resistance. This is in the area where on Sunday about 150 men were rounded up and contained outside the settlement with gunfire over their heads and around them while tanks and bulldozers destroyed, tw destroyed 25 greenhouses, the livelihoods for 300 people. The explosive was right in front of the greenhouses, right in the point of entry for tanks that might come back again. I was terrified to think that this man felt it was less of a risk to walk out in the view of tanks with his children than to stay in his house. I was really scared that they were all going to be shot, and I tried to stand between them and the tank, this happens every day, but just this father walking out with his two children, his two little kids looking very sad, just happens to get my attention more at this particular moment, probably because I felt it was our translation problems that made him leave. I thought a lot about what you said on the phone about Palestinian violence not helping the situation. 60,000 workers from Rafah worked in Israel two years ago. Now only 600 can go to Israel for jobs. Of these 600, many have moved because the three checkpoints between here and Israel make what used to be a 40-minute drive now a 12-hour or impassable journey. In addition, what Rafah identified in 1999 as sources of economic growth are all completely destroyed. The Gaza International Airport runways demolished and totally closed. The border for trade with Egypt, now with a giant Israel sniper tower in the middle of the crossing. Access to the ocean, completely cut off in the last two years by a checkpoint. And the Gush Katif settlement. The count of homes destroyed in Rafah since the beginning of this infatada is up around 600. By and large, people with no connection to the resistance, but who happen to live along the border. I think it is maybe official now that Rafah is the poorest place in the world. There used to be a middle class here, recently. We also get reports that in the past, Gazan flower shipments to, the, to Europe were delayed by two weeks at the Erez crossing for in security inspections. You can imagine the value of two-week-old cut flowers in the European market, so that market dried up. And then the bulldozers come and take people's vegetable farms and gardens. What is left for the people? Tell me if you can think of anything. I can't. If any of us had our lives and welfare completely strangled, lived with children in a shrinking place where we knew, because of previous experience that soldiers and tanks and bulldozers could come for us at any moment and destroy all the greenhouses that we had been cultivating for however long, and did this, 
while some of us were beaten and held captive with 149 other people for several hours, do you think we might try to use somewhat violent means to protect whatever fragments remained? I think about this especially when I see orchards and greenhouses and fruit trees destroyed, just years of care and cultivation. I think about you and how long it takes you to make things grow and what a labor of love it is. I really think in a similar situation, most people would defend themselves as best they could. I think Uncle Craig would. I think probably Grandma would. I think I would. You asked me about nonviolent resistance. When that explosive detonated yesterday, it broke all the windows in the family's house. I was in the process of being served tea and playing with the two small babies. I'm having a really hard time now. Just feel sick to my stomach a lot from being doted on all the time very sweetly, by people who are facing doom. I know that from the United States it all sounds like hyperbole. Honestly, a lot of the time the sheer kindness of the people here, coupled with the overwhelming evidence of the willful destruction of their lives, makes it seem unreal to me. I really can't believe that something like this can happen in the world without a bigger outcry. It really hurts me, again, like it has hurt me in the past, to witness how awful we can allow the world to be. I felt after talking to you that maybe you didn't completely believe me. I think it's actually good if you don't, because I do believe pretty much above all else in the importance of independent critical thinking. And I also realize that with you I'm much less careful than usual about trying to source every assertion that I make. A lot of the reason for that is that I know that you actually go go and do your own research, but it makes me worry about the job that I'm doing. All of the situation that I tried to enumerate above and about a lot of things constitutes a somewhat gradual, often hidden, but nevertheless massive removal and destruction of the ability of a particular group of people to survive. This is what I'm seeing here. The assassinations, rocket attacks, and shooting of children are atrocities. But in focusing on them, I'm terrified of missing their context. The vast majority of people here, even if they had the economic means to escape, even if they actually wanted to give up resisting on their land and just leave, which appears to be maybe the less nefarious of Sharon's possible goals, they can't leave because they can't even get into Israel to apply for visas and because their destination countries won't let them in, both our country and Arab countries. So I think when what all of this means and the survival is cut off in a pen in Gaza, which people can't get out of, I think that qualifies as genocide. Even if they could get out, I think it would still qualify as genocide. Maybe you could look up the definition of genocide according to international law because I don't remember it right now. I'm going to be getting I'm going to get better at illustrating this, hopefully. I don't like to use those charged words. I think you know this about me. I really value words. I really try to illustrate and let people draw their own conclusions. Anyway, I'm rambling. Just want to write my mom and let her know that I'm witnessing the chronic insidious genocide and I'm really scared and questioning my own fundamental belief in the goodness of human nature. This has to stop. I think it is a good idea for us all to drop everything and devote our lives to making this stop. I don't think it's an an extremist thing to do anymore. I still really want to dance around to Pat Benatar and have boyfriends and make comics for my coworkers, but I also want this to stop. Disbelief and horror is what I feel. Disappointment. I'm disappointed that this is the base reality of our world and that we in fact participate in it. This is not at all what I asked for when I came into this world. This is not at all what the people here asked for me. This is not what I meant when I looked at Capitol Lake and said, this is the wide world I'm coming into. I did not mean that I was coming into a world where I could live a comfortable life and possibly with no effort at all, exist in complete unawareness of my participation in genocide. More big explosions somewhere off in the distance. When I come back from Palestine, I probably will have nightmares and constantly feel guilty for not being here. But I can channel that into more work. Coming here is one of the better things I've ever done, so when I sound crazy or if the Israeli military should break with their racist tendency not to injure white people, please pin the reason squarely on the fact that I am in the midst of a genocide which I am also indirectly supporting and for which my government is largely responsible. I love you and Dad. Sorry for the diatribe. Okay, some strange men next to me just gave me some peace, so I need to eat and thank them. Rachel. February 28th. After I wrote to you, I went incommunicado from the affinity group for about 10 hours, which I spent with the family on the front line in High Salam. 
I helped the son with his English homework a little, and we all watched Pet Cemetery, which was a horrifying movie. I think they all thought it was pretty funny how much I had trouble watching it. Friday is the holiday, and when I woke up, they were watching gummy bears dubbed into Arabic, so I ate breakfast with them and sat there for a while and just enjoyed being in this big puddle of blankets with this family watching what for me seemed like Saturday morning cartoons. Then I walked some way to Brazil. The other day, by the way, grandmother gave me a pantomimed lecture in Arabic that involved a lot of blowing and pointing to her black shawl. I got Nidal to tell her that my mother would appreciate knowing that someone here was giving me a lecture about smoking turning my lungs black. I met their sister-in-law, who was visiting from the Nusarat, and played with her small baby. Nidal's English gets better every day. He's the one who calls me my sister. He started teaching grandmother how to say, hello, how are you, in English. You can always hear the tanks and bulldozers passing by, but all these people are genuinely cheerful with each other and with me. When I am with Palestinian friends, I tend to be somewhat less horrified than when I am trying to act in a role of human rights observer, documenter, or direct action resistor. They are a good example of how to be in it for the long haul. I know that the situation gets to them and may ultimately get them on all kinds of levels, but I am nevertheless amazed at their strength in being able to defend such a large degree of their humanity. Laughter, generosity, family time, against the incredible horror occurring in their lives and against the constant presence of death. I felt much better about, about that this morning. I spent a lot of time writing about the disappointment of discovering somewhat firsthand the degree of evil of which we are capable. I should at least mention that I am also discovering a degree of strength and of basic ability for humans to remain human in the direst of circumstances, which I had never seen before. I think the word is dignity. I wish you could meet these people. Maybe, hopefully, someday you will. I think I could see a Palestinian state or a democratic Israeli Palestinian state within my lifetime. I think freedom for Palestine could be an incredible source of hope to people struggling all over the world. I think it could also be an incredible inspiration to Arab people in the Middle East who are struggling under undemocratic regimes which the U.S. supports. I look forward to increasing numbers of middle class privileged people like you and me and becoming aware of the structures that support our privilege and beginning to support the, people, the work of those who aren't privileged to dismantle those structures. One other thing. I think this a lot about public protest, like the one a few weeks ago here that was attended by only about 150 people. Whenever I organize or participate in a public protest, I get really worried that it will just suck, be really small, embarrassing, and that the media will laugh at me. Oftentimes it is really small, and most of the media laughs at us. The weekend after our 150-person protest, we were invited to maybe a 2,000-person protest even though we had a small protest, and of course it didn't get coverage all over the world. In some places the word Rafa was mentioned outside of the Arab press. Colin got a sign in English and Arabic into the protest in Seattle that said Olympia says no to war on Rafa in Iraq. His pictures went up on the Rafa Today website that a guy named Mohammed here runs. People here and everywhere saw those pictures. I think about Glenn going to work going out every Friday for 10 years with tag board signs that address the number of children dead from sanctions in Iraq. Sometimes just one or two people there, and everyone thought they were crazy and they got spit on. Now there are a lot more people on Friday evenings. The juncture between the fourth and between fourth and state is just lined with them, and they get a lot of honks and waves and thumbs ups. They created an infrastructure there for other people to do something. Getting spit on, they made it easier for someone else to decide that they could write a letter to the editor or stand at the back of a rally or do something that seems slightly less ridiculous than standing at the side of the road addressing the deaths of children in Iraq. Just hearing about what you are doing makes me feel less alone, less useless, less invisible. Those honks and waves help. The pictures help. Colin helps. The international media and our government are not going to tell us that we are effective, important, or justified in our work, courageous, intelligent, and valuable. We have to do that for each other. And one way we can do that is by continuing our work visibly. I also think it's important for people in the United States and in a relatively privileged place to realize that people without privilege will be working this no matter what because they are working for their lives. We can work with them and they can know that we work with them or we can leave them to do this work themselves and curse us for our complicity in killing them. I really don't get the sense that anyone here curses us. I also don't get the sense that people here in particular are actually more concerned in the immediate sense about our comfort and health than they are about us risking our lives on their behalf. At least that's the case for me. People try to give me a lot of tea and food in the midst of gunfire and explosive detonation. I love you. Rachel.
Thanks to Corey's last email to her father. Hi, Papa. Thank you for your email. I feel like sometimes I spend all of my time propagandizing the mom and assuming she'll pass stuff on to you so you get neglected. Don't worry about me too much. Right now I am most concerned that we are not being effective. I still don't feel particularly at risk. Rafa has seemed calmer lately, maybe because the military is preoccupied with incursions in the north, still shooting and house demolitions. One death this week that I know of, but not any larger incursions. Still can't say how this will change if, if and when war with Iraq comes. Thanks also for stepping up your anti-war work. I know that it's not easy to do, and probably much more difficult where you are than where I am. I am really interested in talking to the journalists in Charlotte. Let me know what I can do to speed that process along. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do when I leave here and when I'm going to leave. Right now, I think I could stay until June, financially. On the other hand, now that I've, come acro now that I've crossed the ocean, I'm feeling a strong desire to stay across the ocean for some time, considering trying to get a l English teaching jobs. That would, would really like to buckle down and learn Arabic. I also got an invitation to visit Sweden on my way back, which I think I could do very cheaply. I'd like to leave Rafa with a viable plan to return. One of the core members of our group has to leave tomorrow, and watching her say goodbye to people is making me realize how difficult it will be. People here can't leave, so that complicates things. They are also pretty matter-of-fact about the fact that they don't know if they will be alive when we come back. I really don't want to live with a lot of guilt about this place. Being able to come and go so easily and not going back, I think it is valuable to make commitments to places, so I would like to be able to plan on coming back here within a year or so. Of all these possibilities, I think it's most likely that I will at least go to Sweden for a few weeks on my way. I can change tickets and get a plane to, from Paris to Sweden. Let me know if you have any ideas about what I should do with the rest of my life. I love you very much. If you want, you can write to me as if I was on vacation at a camp on the big island of Hawaii learning to weave. One thing I do to make things easier here is to utterly retreat into fantasies that I'm in a Hollywood movie or a sitcom starring Michael J. Fox. So feel free to make something up and I'll be happy to play along. Much love, Poppy. Rachel.